How did you put it? That you said the church is going to be poor or until we have a resurgence? Gravely impoverished. Why? Because of that. Like we... Why, bec- yeah, why can't just religious brothers carry the torch and the few sisters that are out there? Precisely because of the... So let's kind of go big picture, right? Ephesians 5, Revelation 21 and 22. We see in heaven, there's a, a, a dyad that reflects the created order. What is that word United mean? two parts. Two parts, dyad. Like Christ and the bride. Right. So all of all of creation, all of vertebrate creation is dyadic, right? God took the power to generate and divided it into two and turned them toward each other mm. uh, in a mutual reliance. Like you can't generate alone. So generativity and generation is, is, as it were, divided. And then when the two come together, especially rationally, human love, they're drawn up into creativity. That is a reflection of the divine, mm. a communion with the divine. So in heaven, we know it's Christ and the church, the wedding feast of the lamb. He's prepared a spotless bride and they come together ultimately for this, this grand feast. Here on earth, that, so that's the supernatural dyad or the ultimate dyad. Marriage is supposed to be an icon of that, right? In, in mm. Ephesians 5, like it's a great mystery, but I speak as he's describing marriage, I speak in reference to Christ and the church. The celibate states are meant to pass over the gift of, of natural communion with a supernatural blessing and matrimony, skip over that and share in something ultimate, not just to be like a neutered adorer of this grand God, but to participate as a human person created as one half of existence and not the other half mm-hmm. and to let all of one's powers and potencies turn toward that worship and demonstrate something ultimate here. So because there's the ultimate dyad of Christ in the church, or it's like Christ in the church, I can and I do testify to half of the ultimate story. I'm meant to, to bring the heart of Christ down into the world but I can only tell half the story. I tell it to marriage, you know, as, as, as marriage needs to look to like, well, what is it like for Christ to love a bride? I should look to the priest to see that ideally. I look to marriage, be like, what does it look like for a man to love a woman? Mm-hmm. And what does it look like for a woman to love a man? And help me understand what is ideal, be the icon for this. But I've only got half the ability to demonstrate that ultimacy. I do the Christological piece, which is essential for the church, celebrating the sacraments and structuring and ordering hierarchically the goods. But I can't, witness to the other half but by expression and explanation i can't testify in an embodied fashion to the bridal dimension of heaven which is the ecclesiological dimension of heaven and so if we only have priests and living in the celibate state we actually only have half of the ultimate story and yes it's the it's the ultimate piece it's it's showing god here christ's heart but it's not showing the feminine ultimate Mm. the ecclesiological and the marian ultimate so when you take that out of the church the whole church is kind of missing something and doesn't quite know, like the priest becomes a single parent and he also, his his heart has kind of gone to sleep because he's not thinking in, as it were, dyadic terms. He's not thinking about the church as his bride. He's thinking about church as this people to tolerate and navigate and order around and deal with until he can get a day off instead of having a heart that's alive as a bridegroom conformed to Christ, the divine bridegroom. Wow. I'm ranting because no, I love this. Well, yeah. if you are ranting, it's very articulate. Mm. Have you heard of the wolves? This is uh, people who have ever heard me speak. I talk about this. The wolves in Yellowstone. This this is like, I'm going to go off. Stop me as soon as this becomes uninteresting. I promise. So Yellowstone National Park was established to, to mark off a section of the country that's really important to preserve. Okay. Um, at the beginning of the park, park's establishment, there was preceding nature. Like there was this wilderness and they organized it into a park where they boarded it off. In like the 1920s and the 30s, the farmers around the park decided that the wolves are a nuisance and they began to hunt the wolves because they were taking, you know, uh, harming their cattle, etc. So they hunted out all the wolves by I think the mid 40s. The wolves are gone from Yellowstone National Park. As the wolves left, the park adjusted to the absence um, of what's called an apex predator. And the park sat as it were and as it is um, until about the 90s. And in the 90s, a group of conservationists started to say, look, ecosystems theory says when a system is integral and balanced all the parts fit together and balance each other out and inform each other something's missing from the park that's been here from the beginning if we actually want to see nature flourish and and reveal to us the order of nature we need the wolves back so they met all these obstacles people didn't want to bring wolves back who was the apex creature after the wolves went do you know? um, I don't. Well, bears, there's still bears there who yeah. don't have another predator, but they're not as aggressive a, a carnivore. They're mm-hmm. also a lot of the black bears are just eating berries. Grizzly would be a, a full carnivore, but um, they didn't have the presence like wolf packs, you know, and there's mm-hmm. kind of a, like a, a bear uh, behaves and predates very differently than the wolves, which are very mobile. 
So 90s, they start bringing them, or they, they passed legislation, which was opposed uh, by a lot of people. Um, eventually, they got permission to bring the wolves back. They brought in a very small group of wolves, put them in the southern end of the park. <laughs> and ecologists look at this as one of the best examples of what's called a trophic cascade. It's amazing. You can look at videos on YouTube about this. It's really beautiful. Trophic cascade. Trophic cascade. An apex predator's effect trickles down through the entire ecosystem, and its effect is felt from the ground up past just the animals. So what started to happen, I love it, it's so cool. Nature's amazing. It All is. of nature instructs us about supernature, right? Absolutely. And so nature here tells us so much about the church. As the wolves came back in, they started to hunt the elk. And the elk had been herding along the floodplains uh, at the edge of the river, because there's water, there's grass, there's open space, it's all safe, you can see any dangers. So the wolves started to hunt them right on the floodplains immediately, picked off a couple of the calves and some of the elderly. The elk adjusted very quickly, moved into the uplands or into the forest, stopped frequenting the floodplains. What that meant was this grazing force that had been there for decades stopped grazing the floodplains to the ground. And so a wildflower population immediately sprung up that had not been able to grow, which brought in an increase in songbirds, as well as ground rodents, squirrels, rats, mice, which increased the population of foxes and other kind of rodent carnivores. But what also started to happen was um, along the banks of the river, the poplars and the aspens began to grow that had been grazed also to the ground. It's a very soft wood and the elk, it's one of their favorite kind of grazing foods. So these poplars sprung up really quickly and along the riverbanks. And what that did was two things. One, it fortified riverbanks that had previously been subject to erosion. Wow. And it put a shade canopy over the edge of the riverbank, which increased these subaquatic ecosystems or like micro ecosystems, um, fortifying the banks was one factor in the significant change. The other factor is that the beavers came back up the river. They'd been outside of that park since pretty much the wolves left, but they found new trees to harvest, new dams could be built right there. So the fortified banks and the new beaver dams actually changed the course of the river. It didn't erode as much, it became narrower, stronger, and the, they, they say the course of the rivers was modified it's slightly, but you can see a difference in the rivers over that time. So the point being, the entire park was, as it were, suffering in the absence of a oh. key member, Glory and the shift affected everything. And I, the the one-to-one the -one I draw, the analogy, that's the religious woman. And like, they don't like to be called wolves, <laughs> but like, <laughs> they're at the, they're the top. I mean, they're conformed to the bride in, in what's called the supreme or perfect state of conformity to, to God by the vows. When you take that out, everything has to adjust. So oh think about how gosh. we adjusted the church. We lost our teachers. We lost many of our healthcare professionals, but also we lost the witness, the eschatological witness of the bride who informs the church visibly as an icon, and, and everything adjusted. Priests became single parents, if you will, or, or didn't understand again, or lost a sense of that. The other, the bride whom they serve, embodied in Mary, embodied in the, in the religious woman. We shifted the way we do schools. Our stewardship campaigns in the average parish is driven by a very large budget, significant portion of which is a school that's full of lay teachers, which have to have a salary and have to have benefits. And we didn't need to supply those things before because the religious community sustained their sisters and they had a vow of poverty. So the, the shifting functionally is massive, but I argue metaphysically, ontologically, the, the poverty is so profound and raw that we've forgotten who the church actually is. We've lost the, the shimmering, the glimmering Marian testimony, which is eschatological in the religious woman. And so we actually don't know ourselves. And we're like the park, we're kind of breathing on one lung or we're kind of limping and along. We don't even real, most of us don't even realize it. No, because we grew up without sisters. I mean, did you see sisters growing up? I saw, there's a couple of sisters, old, unveiled. Yeah, which is- Two or three I knew. Yeah. <laughs> two that, or three what? Two or three, that's all oh, I yeah, knew. Yeah. Two or Total. three nuns, not veiled. Yeah, not living a vibrant life at that time because yeah. they were trying to adjust a lot of, the, they're trying to become more relevant or meet the culture and, and understandably they made some decisions that in hindsight look silly, but back then look good, but mm. we never bounce back. My, my argument is we never bounce back. And it's until the sisters are back, it's the concern of the entire local church to be doing this work because there aren't sisters doing it. Like up until the eighties, probably maybe the nineties, there were always religious women taking care of girls who are discerning and the priest taking care of the guys and marriage taking care of the families. We all kind of work together. As the sisters dropped off, we kept going with marriage, kept going with priesthood, but nobody was encouraging the young women to think about it because there was nowhere to point and no one to walk with them. And so we just stopped encouraging religious vocations and almost started to act like it's supposed to be gone. And like, really, we need a paradigm shift in which we like refuse to imagine the future of the church without religious sisters, even if we don't even know what that would look like. If we accept that the metaphysical, the ontological account of the church as a system, as a body, as an ecosystem, we're sick. 
and we're missing something that we don't even know what it would look like to have because we grew up in a church without it. But it's been there since the beginning. There've always been women consecrated to Christ in an exclusive loving spousal bond. So how do we bring the wolves back? <laughs> Dude, that's, the, that's, how do we so that's my full-time the assignment. I'm literally assigned full-time to uh, what? work for the Renewal of Women's Religious Life. I'll go, I'll start Aren't on you, Tuesday. That's crazy, I didn't know that. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment below letting us know what you thought about the video.